Okay, yay, we got it. Okay, so 2.3 linear equations. So we've got to cover the definition first. It says a first order DE of the form, and it says A1x dy dx, A0x y, and then g of x. What does that mean? It means I'm going to have a function in front of my derivative, right? And I could also have a function in terms of x next to the variable y, but then I'll also have a function in terms of x over here on the right-hand side, okay? So it has to fit that form, which means you can't have y squared, right? You can't have y's multiplied by your dy dx. It has to be able to fit this form, okay? If it fits this form, then we know it's linear in terms of y. And we talked about that in 1.2, I think it was, or 1.1, when we were going over the definitions of everything. Um, so in that regard, we know that this fits that definition, okay? Now, when this function here is just zero, so it, the left-hand side fits the form, but the right-hand side is zero, it has a special name and it's called homogeneous or homogeneous, it's the same word. I say homogeneous, but I've had students the other way. Um, otherwise, if it's not zero on the right-hand side, then it's called a non-homogeneous equation, okay? And there will be times later where it matters whether it's homogeneous or not homogeneous, okay? For this section, it makes no difference. You do the problem exactly the same. Um, but there will be sections in, I think, chapter three or four later that they'll specifically talk about how to solve homogeneous equations, and then they'll specifically talk about how to solve non-homogeneous equations, okay? So just keep in mind that it has to fit that definition. If it fits this definition, no matter what function of x I have right here, I could divide all three of these terms by that function, okay? If I did, that function would cancel here, and all I'd have left is dy dx, right? And over here, I'd have some other possibly fraction function, right, in front of y. That's all this is. This just represents some function in terms of y. It may be a fraction, maybe not. It depends on what that is, okay? Then, of course, if I take this and I divide by that same function, I'll end up with another function over here on this, sense, on this side, right? If this was homogeneous, it means this was zero. So would it matter what I divided by? It would still be zero here, right? Okay? But if it wasn't zero, then I will have another function f of x over there on the right-hand side. Okay? Now, someone somewhere figured this out. I can't tell you who because I do not know. <laughs> um, but someone figured out that you can solve this DE if you multiply every single term by this factor. Okay? It's E, the number E, 2.58, blah, 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 right? Raised to the integral of P of X, whatever that function is in front of there. Okay, they figured out that if you multiply each one of these terms by this, you can then solve the DE, okay? So it's very interesting, I mean, how they came up with it, I'm sure they probably had to have solved thousands and thousands of these things to notice that pattern. Um, but somebody figured that out, and so that's going to be our guidelines to solving the first order DEs. Now, I do want you to keep in mind. I have on the board the four different methods that we're gonna learn, right, for this whole chapter. We already know separable, this section is linear, then we're gonna cover exact, and then we're gonna cover substitution. One DE equation, one differential equation, could be solved in all four of those manners if the rules apply, the restrictions apply. If you can turn it into this form, then you can use that strategy to solve it, okay? So we have a strategy for separable. We had to get everything in terms of x next to dx, right? And then everything in terms of y next to dy equal to zero. If we were able to get that, then we were able to solve its separable equations method. This is just another method. So some of the equations that we solve may have been possible to solve using separation, but because we're in the section of learning how to solve with the linear method, we're gonna have to solve it with the linear method, okay? But it's nice, if you're good at separable, you can use that to check your answer, because you should still get the same answer, okay? 
but you just have to be careful on the directions. And on the test, I give you one equation, one equation, and I ask you four questions. Is it separable? If so, solve it using the separable method. Is it linear? If so, solve it using the linear method. Is it exact? If so, solve it using the exact problem. So if it follows all four definitions, you're gonna be doing that same problem four times on the test, okay? But, <laughs> are you looking at me like you're mad? <laughs> He's like, you're evil. <laughs> um, but the cool thing about that is if you do have one on the test that is all four methods, you should be getting all the same answers, right? So you have kind of like a checking mechanism built in on that problem, okay? So here's a strategy. First, you're gonna put the DE to this linear form. It's called standard form. Back when we were doing chapter one definitions, that is standard form. Um, and then you're going to multiply every term by this integrating factor is what they call it, okay? So this thing here is the integrating factor. And I do side work with this. I actually find that integral and see if I can simplify this expression before I go start multiplying it by everything, okay? Once I do that, once I figure out what that is, I'm going to multiply everything by that. And then the left-hand side will automatically become the derivative of the integrating factor and y. And I'll show you why that is, okay? It has to do with product rule, but I'll explain it when we see an example, okay? Therefore, what you end up with is d dx equal to the integrating factor times y, and then on the other hand side, you'll have that function f of x times the integrating factor, okay? That's just what you'll coincidentally end up with. Then eventually you have to integrate both sides. So if I integrate this side, what's the integral of a derivative? They're inverses of each other, aren't they? So if I take the integral of this derivative, I'm just gonna end up with what I have inside those brackets. Whereas if I take the integral of this side, who knows what that's gonna look like and it'll have its own function. And then in order for me to figure out what y is, I would just have to divide both sides by that integrating factor again. So there's lots and lots of algebra here, and we've got some calculus in there as well. Right? Now, this is just an extra little bit, okay? It says if the limit as x goes to infinity of yc, yc being the solution that you're going to get here from part two, if that limit of those terms equals zero, then it's called the transient term, okay? So you're going to be looking, once you figure out y equals this plus this plus this, you're going to take the limit of each one of those terms. And if the limit of those terms is zero, then those are considered to be called transient terms. Okay? Again, we're going to see examples of all this. I just need to get the definitions underway. Okay? So let's look at example one. Okay? And I might need to bring that page back in a minute. Um, Example one says, find the general solution of the given differentiable equation and determine whether there are any transient terms in the general solution, okay? So first thing I need to do is make sure that's in standard form. Is this in standard form? Does it follow this form here? It does. What is P of X? Uh-huh, that's the function that's in front of y, isn't it? And all it has is a co an invisible, right? An invisible coefficient of one. What is f of x? e to the three x, you got it. Whatever's on the right-hand side, correct? Now, what is the integrating factor? This is the stuff I do on the side. The integrating factor is e, the integral of p of x dx. And in my case, it's e to the integral of 1 dx. What is the integral of 1 dx? It's x. Just x. So I get e to the x. Now you don't need to put the plus c's here. All they're going to do is cause um, constant multipliers. So you don't worry about your constants here. The constants will come out um, later as you start integrating, okay? So that's something you need to know, right? Because if you start putting those constants in too soon, you're gonna be getting some weird um, problems. 
Don't put your plus C here. So, so okay? only when the limit equals zero, that means that it's, it's I'm not zero. done yet. I haven't found my general solution. I'm asking a general question. Yes. I'm saying uh, only if limit of the term of the, of the YC equals mm -hmm. zero, and YC is called a transient term. Right? Correct. So if I take the limit of one term and I get zero, that term is considered transient term. And you may have one term or you may have multiple terms in your general solution. You take the limit of each one individually and determine if each one of them is the transient. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this simplified version and I'm going to multiply it to every term here. And I'm going to show you that number two is true in my method because it told me that it's supposed to come out to look like this form once you multiply by that transient factor or I'm sorry, integrating factor. So all I did was multiply everybody by my integrating factor, okay? Now, the right-hand side is easy to simplify. What do you do with the exponents when the bases are the same and you're multiplying? Mm -hmm. So what's x plus 3x? 4x. 4x. So that's what I have on the right-hand side. That's okay. Whatever I have here is not what's important, okay? hand side is supposed to be this okay so by definition it's supposed to come out to the the integrating factor which was e to the x times y that's what it says it's supposed to come out to is that true okay we need to verify that that's true now what you need to do is, this is going to be a function in terms of x, isn't it? Isn't y a function in terms of x? So when you're taking the derivative of e to the x times y, both of these are functions in terms of x. You just don't know what this function is. Therefore, you are required to do the product rule here. And how do you do the product rule? It's the first term, e to the x, times the derivative of the second term, which is dy dx, plus the second term, y, times the derivative of the first term. What's the derivative of e to the x? Same, e to the x, okay? So it's like you're doing the reverse of the derivative rule, the product rule, okay? And that's all they said. You don't have to write this out they're telling you that it's always going to come out to be this, okay? I, I just have a question. Sure. How, do, how, do, how, do, how do things get transformed from the first equation to the second one? I mean, from e By to this or? rule here. This says it's going to be that. And I'm just verifying that it's true. Okay. So, so this, this methodology says that once you multiply everything by that factor, mm -hmm. the left-hand side will automatically become the derivative of the integrating factor and y. So the left-hand side automatically should look like this. And I'm just verifying that that is actually true. Okay. You just have to memorize this one? Yes, this memorize one Memorize this form and mm -hmm. then prove it, if it's true or not. Yes. You can write it down and then just make sure that it's true. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you just have to know it then. You have it. to know that one. Or you can learn how to do the product rule in reverse. If you know how to do the product rule in reverse, then you can do it that way as well. I'll ask you later about it. Yeah. Okay, so then now let's go ahead and figure this out. So now what I'm going to do to solve this problem is I'm going to integrate this side and I'm going to integrate this side, right? This is my attempt to actually solve the DE, okay? What happens when you integrate a derivative? Mm -hmm. The derivative and the integral just basically cancel each other out and you just get the function all by itself. On the right hand side, you have to actually integrate that. And I did go into detail in one of the beginning chapters how you do this with substitution, but ultimately in the end you're going to end up with 1 fourth e to the 4x. Now, I could put plus C1 here and then plus C2 here, but what happens to the C1? You're going to minus it over here, aren't you? 
So it's just going to be a C over there. So you don't have to put it on the left hand side. You can if you want to and then just move it over later. Now I've got a couple of steps here because I do not have it the way we want y equal to something, right? So what would be my first step to solve for y? Actually probably the only step, right? Divide by e to the x, which means I have to divide every term by e to the x. Okay? So I get y equals, now what do you do when they have the same base and you're dividing? What happens to the exponents? You subtract. So what's 4x minus x? 3x. And over here, I'm just going to write it as c e to the negative x so that I don't have any fractions that I can avoid. I couldn't avoid the 1 fourth, but I could avoid the rest of it. Now, this is it. I'm done. I have solved the DE, okay? But, and that is the general form. It has the C's in there and everything, right? The only thing is, is that I haven't figured out which of these terms, if any, are transitive terms, right? So we take the limit of both of them. Take the limit as X goes to infinity of 1 fourth E to the 3X and take the limit as x goes to infinity of c e to the negative x. Okay. What am I going to get for this limit? You can use a graph, you can use a table, whatever you've got to use to figure that out. I'll use the graph. We, get, we get the infinity. You do get infinity because it's an exponential, right? And it just goes straight up to infinity. I can draw it. But I'm going to cheat. <laughs> You're going to have a graphing calculator. So you can use one. Um, but I'm going to graph that so you can see what happens. These are not the right things. There's the baby ones. Somebody apparently stole my batteries for the remote control. <laughs> okay. So let's go to Y. Let me clear out any weird stuff that I had before. And I'm going to enter 0.25E. And I really don't care about the 1 fourth. That's not the important part. The important part is the E raised to the 3X graph. As X goes to infinity, what is happening to my function? I'll get this a little bit closer so you can see. As x goes in that direction, what's happening to the graph's y values? Where are they going? Up, skyrocketing up, right? So yes, this is going to be infinity. Now I don't care, just like I didn't graph that constant, it doesn't make a difference. It's just a constant multiplier. I'm not gonna worry about the other constant. I'm just gonna put a negative in front of there. As x goes to infinity, what happens to the y values of that graph? What do the y values go to? Zero. They're getting closer and closer to that x-axis, right? Which the y value is zero at the x-axis. So this one is not a transient term, but this one is. So what I'm gonna say here is the transient term is e, e to the negative x, okay? So in your book, if you're doing the odd problems, um, it's going to have the answer, and then it's going to have a semicolon, and then it's going to tell you which one of those terms is the transient term, okay? So make sure you have both of those. Okay, let's go into example two. So looking at this one, this one would not be separable. If I multiply by dx and dx, I'm going to have x's and y's with the wrong components. Um, and so it's going to cause an issue. It's not going to be separable at all. So this one, I would have to have another method to solve it. So first thing we're going to do is, is this in standard form? 
look at standard form again real quick and then look at what I've got is that in standard form I heard and saw a couple of people say yes and then I heard somebody say no if you're saying no then why not correct there should be nothing in front of dy dx in order for it to be in standard form so what do I do to make this go away mm -hmm. so I'm gonna divide every term by X and so then I get dy dx equals oops not equals minus y over x equal to can I reduce that this here yes. we just get x sine x right okay now it's in standard form here's the harder part right what is p of x negative 1 over x that is what is being multiplied by y what is f of x mm -hmm. and there's no need to write this on the side I just do so that we're visually being able to um, tell that that's in standard form okay if I can identify these pieces then I know I'm in standard form okay this guy's by himself I've got something in front of y and then something else in terms of x. So the integrating factor, I'm just going to put i f, that stands for integrating factor. It's e to the integral of p of x dx. And in this example, that's e to the integral negative 1 over x dx. Now the negative is just a constant. So I'm going to factor out that constant. And I end up with negative integral of 1 over x dx as the exponent. What is the integral of 1 over x dx? Anybody remember? Mm -hmm. It is natural log of x. Now, usually you have bars around it, but again, it's not going to matter. Um, I don't know if I want to go all of that. I did the problem in the previous class both ways. So I pretended as if x were a positive number, and then I pretended as if x were a negative number. And I did the example twice. Uh -huh. And then you just notice that in the negative one, all the negatives cancel out as you're doing your algebra. So that's why when you're doing this here, we're already informal because we don't put the plus C, right? It's even more informal not to put the absolute values on it, okay? So when you're doing your integrating factor, those are two things you're allowed to get away with. It's only going to, it's going to put extra things in there for no reason at all, okay? because the negatives will cancel and because your constant terms will just become regular constant terms. So we don't worry about those. So we leave it informal like this. Now, remember what a negative exponent means. It means that that is in the denominator, right? That's what a negative exponent means. It means that that whole factor is in the denominator. And then does anybody remember the rule for e to the ln of x? E's and ln's are what? Inverse functions. Mm -hmm. Inverse. So they cancel. So all you have is x there. And that's it. Which looks a lot nicer to multiply by, right? <laughs> than all this other weird stuff that's been there. Okay? So what you do is you go back to your original and you multiply everything by 1 over x. So I'm going to take dy dx times 1 over x, my minus y times 1 over x, and my x sine x times 1 over x. Now the left hand side we know 
we know it's supposed to come out to according to that rule my integrating factor times y according to that uh, methodology in the guidelines number two says the left hand side is supposed to automatically become this okay oh and I made a mistake what am I missing here uh-huh right wasn't that the term that was right there it should have been over X and then I'm just multiplying it now by a red 1 over X so the automatic rule says that the left side of the equation should equal that should equal that and I like to verify just to make sure, right? So doing your product rule again, you get the first factor, one over X, times the derivative of the second factor, which is dy dx. Then you get the second factor, Y, which is there, times the derivative of one over X. Side note, what is the derivative of one over X? I just, I just kind of messed up what we're doing from the first step to the second step, the last one. From here to here. According to the left side of the equation. The left side of the equation is going into the form according to the guideline. What are doing in order for it to be that form? What are doing You're just there? rewriting it into its equivalent form. Oh, just rewriting it. Mm -hmm. So 1 over x is x to the negative 1. How do you take the derivative of that? How do you take the derivative of anything that has an exponent? power rule means you bring down the power and then you decrease the power by one if I decrease that power by one what do I have now negative two. negative two and then if I keep my negative one on top but that negative exponent turns positive if I move that downstairs so I get that the derivative is negative one over x squared do I have negative one over x squared here I do so all I'm doing is verifying that this is equivalent to this, like the guideline says it is, okay? The left-hand side should automatically be able to be rewritten that way. But it's hard for people to recognize looking at two terms and saying, oh, that's equivalent to what I would have gotten before I took the derivative of such and such, right? So that's why they give you the guideline and tell you that it's going to happen that way, okay? And then you can verify it if you want to just to make sure you're not doing anything wrong, right? You didn't multiply by the wrong integrating factor or anything, okay? Okay, so since, uh, if, if you want to look at it that way, mm -hmm. right here is the y over, one over x times one over x. Uh, oh, you just, okay. Okay, so here looking at it that way, we, we take it, we just take the, the well, well, y is in terms of x, right? Y is so, a function in terms so of x. in terms of x, so, the y over x, we take the what is on the left side of it, right? Mm -hmm. Put it inside brackets. Mm -hmm. Then times the y. The y. Mm -hmm. And outside, we just do uh, the d dx. D dx. Mm -hmm. It's so basically your integrating factor times y. And yeah. that's what they told me here in the rule. It says the left hand side will become the derivative of the integrating factor and y. So whatever this was when you simplified it, Mine just happened to be 1 over x when I simplified it. It'll always be d dx of this times y. Always. So, 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 if we, if we, so we look at the first part. It's dy over dx. So on where I'm multiplying by dx. So that's why I put d over dx. That's how I figure out, right? No. Uh, so that's how I figure out that it's d over dx, for example, and not d that's, over dy. Yes. Yes. Because of this. Because, yeah, because you are yeah, integrating with respect to x. Yes, you're correct. Mm hmm but notice that your right hand side changes when you start to write this in this form, right? My right hand side is not going to be x sine x anymore. What is it going to be? Just sine x. Which is good because I was getting worried on how we were going to integrate x sine x. <laughs> that was not going to be fun. But now we can integrate, right? And I'm going to go ahead and go, I'll use purple. But if I integrate this side with the dx and I integrate this side and put a dx, remember the integral and the derivative undo each other. So I just end up with the 1 over x times y. On the right hand side, what is the integral of sine? Negative cosine. 
Mm-hmm, negative cosine of x. And here I do have to put the plus c. This is the one place I have to put the plus c. I didn't need it on the left-hand side because it would have to move over to the right-hand side later anyway. Now, how do I solve for y? We're going to divide the right side of the equation with, over, uh, with 1 over x. Not, yeah, divide by 1 over x, which is the same as doing what? Multiplying by x. So if I multiply by x there, it cancels. If I multiply by x here, it cancels. And then if I, not cancels, but it ends up being in the term. And if I multiply by x, I end up with cx there. And y is solved for. So this is my solution. However, I have one extra step that they want me to do, which is determine whether if either of these is a transient term. So you take the limit as x goes to infinity of negative x cosine of x and the limit as x goes to infinity of cx. It doesn't matter what the constant is. If it's just x, what happens to it when x goes to infinity? It's just a line, right? And as I move to the right, what's happening to my y values on that line? So if I graph x, as I move to the right, where are the y values going? Say again? Infinity. Mm hmm Infinity. The other one's a little bit harder, and I don't even know what that looks like in a graph, so let's go graph that one. I know what cosine looks like, but then you throw in the negative x, and it might alter it a little bit. And it does alter it a little bit. Let me zoom out so you can see what's happening. What is happening to this thing? Those little humps are getting higher and higher and higher, right? And they're going and going and going. If you want, you can think of this in pieces. As x goes to infinity for this, it's going to be going traveling between negative 1 and 1 in a regular way, right? But then, if I multiply it by an x, that's going to make it go to infinity. Anything between negative infinity and positive infinity. It doesn't matter whether it goes to positive infinity or whether it goes to negative infinity. Does it go to zero? <laughs> no. So that's all I'm worried about, is whether or not it goes to zero. Okay? So like, as if we're, we're finding cosine infinity, right, basically? Mm-hmm. infinity. Mm -hmm. So cosine infinity, can you show me the graph here? Mm-hmm. So... Going up and down between positive infinity and negative infinity. Positive Infinity, negative infinity. Those peaks will keep going higher and higher and higher. We can do it the other way. We can just find the cosine x alone, cosine infinity alone. Uh, draw the cosine x one. Mm -hmm. Which is going to be any number between 1 and negative 1. Or negative 1 and 1. So if you go to this graph, right. delete, your y values are always between 1 and negative 1. So no matter how far you go to the right, it's always going to be something between 1 and negative so as if, 1. As if it is a constant. Mm -hmm. okay. You multiply it by an infinity and it'll become infinity. We just don't know if it'll be a positive infinity or a negative infinity because it depends. Are you on the upper curve or are you on the lower part of the curve, right? But either way, it's not zero. And neither is this one. This one is also not zero. So do we have a transient term here? No transient term. So we're really having to bring everything back, right? We have to bring back all of our derivative rules, all of our integration rules, even the limit stuff. Um, we're having to recall, call it all back, okay? Let's see, number three. So number three, number three is also not separable. So I wouldn't have been able to solve it using the only other method we know so far. 
we will require it to use this method so far. Once we learn two more methods, there may be another way to do this. Okay. Is this one in standard form? Is it in standard form? How do you know if it is or isn't? What are you supposed to be looking for? Correct. That's what you look for. This term right here should not have anything in front of it. Okay. If it does, you need to get rid of it, right? So I'm going to divide every term by what's in front of it. So that makes these go away, and I have dy dx plus, and this can reduce, cubed and a squared, how many will I have left? You can reduce some of those, right? You can cancel out cosine squared, but what fraction will I have after I cancel out cosine squared? Cosine x over sine x. Mm -hmm. And then your y. And then over here, nothing will cancel out, so you're just stuck with that. Now you could change it into cosecant and secant squared, but I would wait until after you figure out what your integrating factor is before you start messing with the right hand side. Okay? So let's do that. Let's go figure out what our integrating factor is. First of all, what is p of x? Because we need to know that before we can find the integrating factor. What am I visually looking for when I'm trying to identify p of x? Where is p of x located in standard form? In front of y. So what do I have in front of y here? Cosine x over sine x. And so then to find my integrating factor, I have to do e to the integral of p of x dx. And in this case, that's cosine x over sine x dx. Now here you have to use um, substitution and you have to remember your rules for substitution but because sine of x is downstairs that's going to be my u. If it was the term with the power or if it was inside a square root or anything like that that would have been my u. Okay because that's the one that's being messed with. So I'm gonna say u equals sine of x and then what is the u? What is the derivative of sine of x? Cosine. Cosine x, and then of course you tag on the dx, right? So now when I substitute everything, this will become e to the integral of du over u. Another way of writing that is 1 over u du. So the sine was my u and it was downstairs, and then this whole part became the du, right? And what is the integral of 1 over u du? ln of u. And like we said, we don't need the plus c, and we don't need the absolute value bars, okay? They're not necessary here. But what happens to the e and the ln? Mm -hmm. And I just have u all by itself. Now my problem didn't have u's in it, so I cannot go multiply by u, right? What should I be multiplying by? Sine x. Okay, so let's go to our original and multiply everything by sine x. Okay, 
Now the left hand side, you don't need to simplify it at all. If you just use the rule, you know that's gonna end up becoming the derivative of my integrating factor times y. And be careful, because the y is not in that angle. It's kind of like that, right? x is the angle that you're taking for sine, and y is just a multiplier. Okay. On the right hand side, what happens with the sine x? Mm -hmm. So you have 1 over cosine squared x. What is another way of writing 1 over cosine squared x? What is 1 over cosine? Just a regular cosine. for sine. For cosine is what? Just secant. But because it's squared, I'm going to have secant times secant, which is what? Mm -hmm. And that's important because this is, you can't take the integral of that, but you can take the integral of this. Yes? I think there's a little mistake. It should be cosine of Here? Yeah, no, on the left side. On the left side? But you don't need to simplify this. Oh, we don't need No, you, you can verify that that is equal to this. And if you do cancel those, that is true. Because you get the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. So yes, you could simplify it to verify that this is true, but you don't have to mess around with that at all. Right, but like for example, okay, so why did we put sine x of y and we didn't, we didn't put cosine x over sine x of y? Why just pick the sine of x of y? Because it's always the integrating factor times y. So the integrating factor, integrating factor. And the integrating factor is? Oh, okay, the integrating factor. Okay, I got yes. It. Okay, so I'm going to integrate both sides, integrate this side, integrate this side. The left hand side, that just kind of cancels away and I get sine of x times y. The right hand side, the integral of secant squared is tangent. And then your plus c. And you can verify if you have your textbook with you and you open the front cover it has all the formulas there for you okay so if you'll notice in there there was no formula for this but there was a formula for secant squared which is why I wanted to write it in that equivalent form okay and then now how do we get y all by itself mm -hmm. by sign Now here it's a little bit weird. So this will cancel and I'll have y all by itself. And I'm gonna write it with no fractions. What is tangent over sine x? Does anybody know? 10x over sine x? What do you end up with? It is cosine x. Remember what tangent is. So I'm gonna scribble over here just to do side work, right? You have 10x over sine x. That can be written as tan x times one over sine x. And tan x is sine x over cosine x. And so what happens to those sine x's? Actually, it's not cosine x, because what happens to these guys? You get one over cosine. But what is that without a fraction? 
No, not powers, just trig identities. Secant. So that shouldn't have been cosine x, it should have been what? Secant x. It did have something to do with cosines though, right? <laughs> Close. So okay. What do we do here? Why are we divide to a sine x? Because we're solving for y. Oh, okay. So we're trying to get y by itself. Okay, yeah, yeah. And then what about the sine x? If I don't want it to be in the denominator, what trig function can I use instead of uh, 1 over sine x? Cosecant x. Cosecant x. Uh-huh. Cosecant x. I mean, you could leave it with the fractions with sines and cosines, but if you go look in the back of the book, it's not going to have the cosines and sines. It's going to have secants and cosecants. Okay? But I just want you to know how they're getting those. They're using their little trig identities. It takes a lot of time to memorize them. It's a very yes. Memorize. And that you are allowed to have on your, during your test. I provide one that has not only the derivatives that's inside your cover, the derivatives and the integrals, but then I give you the trig identities as well. Are the trig identities in the front as well of your book? Mm -hmm. Check in the front cover. So I know you have your integrals and your derivatives, mm -hmm. but no, you don't have the trigs. So I have all the trigs in there too, like sine is, one over sine is cosine, cosecant, all of that. Um, I'll need to bring one. I have to remember to print it because I keep forgetting. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. So we've got that one. I think we have one more. And the only thing different about this one, it's going to be the same methodology. I know we're repeating it, but I need to repeat. It's best to do things over and over and over again so you kind of get the idea versus just doing it one time and saying, oh, look, there, I showed you. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes, we're missing that. Because it says it has the same directions as 1 and 2, right? So we need to figure out if any of these are transients, right? So thank you. Good good call. So as x goes to infinity of secant x, and as x goes to infinity of c cosecant x. The constant's not going to affect anything. Here, it is best to have them in their fraction forms. So this is 1 over cosine x. Or maybe even just the graph. This is C over sine x. Let's see what those graphs look like. Y clear. I don't think there's zero, but let's verify. One over cosine x. Let me do zoom trig. It's not going to let me. As x is going to the right, this thing is all over the place, right? And let's answer this question. Is y value ever zero? Never. So it doesn't even matter if this limit exists or not exists. It's definitely not zero, right? <laughs> let's go look at the other one. We don't worry about the c, but we definitely need to see what's happening to 1 over sine. Okay? This one is the exact same graph that's just shifted over pi halves unit, okay? But does it ever equal zero? No. So when x goes to infinity, it's still never going to equal zero. So when neither one of them equals zero, what do we say? No transient terms. Good catch. I totally forgot about that. Okay, example four is our last one for this section, and it doesn't have the same directions, okay? All of these ask me to find a general solution, and then just determine if the terms of that general solution were transient or not, okay? But this one, whenever they ask you for an initial value problem, they're not asking you for the general solution. They're asking you for a specific solution one that ties specifically to this condition, okay? Of course, you have to find the general solution to find the specific solution, right? We don't have transient terms here because you're not going to worry about the general solution. That's not going to be your final answer, 
okay? So your, your directions are a little bit different here. I am still gonna do the same thing. This one is a little tiny bit different. Where's the dy dx? So y prime is dy dx. Mm -hmm. Y prime is dy dx. And is that term by itself? No. So we first have to divide everybody by x so we can see it in standard form. I'm going to write it as 1 over x times y because I already know I'm going to have to pull it apart, right? Because we're going to need to identify what the p of x is. And what is p of x in this one? 1 over x. Mm -hmm. What's the integral of 1 over x dx? ln of x. And what's e to the ln of x? x. So we're going to multiply all of our terms times x. Now remember, you do not have to simplify the left-hand side. All you need to do is put it in its derivative form, okay? I know you're inclined to cancel these x's, but <laughs> you don't need to. It doesn't make a difference if you do or don't. This should be the transient term, which was what? x times y. And on the right-hand side, that's the one you can simplify. What happens to the x's on the right-hand side? Mm -hmm. So you just have e to the x. Good. And again, if you're not sure if this is correct, you do your product rule, right? The first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. What's the derivative of x? And if I cancel those axes, what do I have in front of y? One, right? So it does follow. Now integrating this one's not so bad, right? <laughs> like we already tortured you with all the other problems. Let's take it easy for a second. So the derivatives and the integral undo each other. Over here, the integral of e to the x is e to the x. Put your plus c. And then how do I get y all by itself? Mm -hmm. So we get e to the x over x plus c over x. Now you could rewrite that. I wouldn't just yet. I would wait. But really it could be rewritten as um, x to the negative 1 e to the x plus c x to the negative 1. Usually the solutions manual doesn't put fractions. It's to save paper, to be honest. It's the only reason why they don't put fractions in the solution manual. So you'll notice it'll be in this form versus this form, okay? But for me, when I'm going to work it out and plug in my numbers, I'd rather have it in fractions, okay? So I'm going to take this. This is not my final answer. I have to use my initial condition. So remember, this inside here is the x value. This here is the y value. So the y is going to become a 2, and the x's are going to become what? 1. So this will be e to the 1 over 1 plus c over 1. So if I clean that up, it's just going to be e plus c. And then how do I solve for c? Mm -hmm. So I get 2 minus E equals C. So then I'm going to go back up here and plug that in. So I get Y equals X to the negative 1 E to the X plus 2 minus E X to the negative 1. Now the book may have this or they may have something like this. Okay, or these two terms, any of the terms might be in a different order, right? 
I didn't look to see what the book had in the back of, so I don't know what they wrote, but it would be one of those forms or something equivalent to it. Okay. 